Freedom Abolition is a video series that explores the theories and practical implications of anarchism using thought experiments. This video does not advocate illegal behavior or activities. It is merely a philosophical discussion about hypothetical scenarios. Welcome back to another episode of Freedom Abolition. So what is the end goal for anarchism? Uh, that question actually has many different answers. This being because the end goal for all anarchists is different. All anarchists are unified in that they aim to abolish the state and thus construct a sustainable society that is absent state power. So obviously there are a lot of things that go into the maintenance society outside of the act of the abolition of government in order to sustain the functioning of society. As there are many different competing theories surrounding the philosophy of anarchism, there have been many solutions proposed concerning how society might sustain itself, how society might organize itself in the absence of state. For instance, anarcho-communists believe in the potentially violent overthrow of all systems of capitalism and private property. Uh, anarcho-capitalists believe in the preservation of private property in the absence of state through self-determination, self-defense, and adherence to principles such as the non-aggression principle which considers the destruction or theft of property as an act of violence. We have the green anarchists who believe in the sabotage and destruction of all forms of industry to return society to uh, the most ecologically friendly and sustainable state. We have anarcho-pacifists who believe against all uses of violence and are very specifically anti-war, etc., etc. However, society has always and must always still contend against the forces of nature, and so we might predict that effects of nature will limit the possibilities of how a stateless society could be structured, uh, at least in the long run, in order to sustain itself. In the short term, I would predict that many variations of societal structure would manifest themselves and become prevalent. I think ex economic systems might have the potential to become extremely diversified, uh, within a system of anarchism in which there is no central authority imposing any specific modes of economic production upon society or certain segments of society. And I think broadly the principles of anarchism would prevent the coercion of any individuals or groups into the realization of other individuals or groups and goals. However, I do believe different forms of social interaction and other forms of what, what people may consider coercion under different interpretations of the principles of anarchism would end up in the long run forcing society to structure itself into a network of agrarian and industrial communes and small industrial centers which would be analogous to cities, etc. as we know them now. I think society would still preserve a lot of economic variation, some segments of society maintaining systems of capitalism and private property, uh, others being fully communist to collectivize, absent of all property rights. Uh, other segments may innovate new systems of economy that we've never even thought of yet, um, and uh, others may adopt some form of some combination of capitalism and socialism. Ultimately, as the different groups adopt different modes of economy, some possibly conflicting with each other, different philosophies conflicting with each other, contention may arise between groups, and I, I think it would be necessary for groups to confederate uh, in order to maintain peace as military conflict will most likely prove to be more destructive than it has been beneficial to any groups of society and the complete elimination of certain modes of economy which may be viewed as negative or detrimental or, or carrying the potential to detriment non-participant groups there would be some motivation between groups to to resort to military action yet the complete eradication of any modes of economy or systems of organization may may prove to be impossible and prohibitively expensive for any group to carry out. So federation allows groups to form broad treaties which are based on adherence to, to specific rules while still allowing for a lot of variation within individual groups. And it results in a quite effective system of treaties to mitigate violence and prevent war from breaking out between the groups. So the reason that I would predict uh, systems of communes would prevail as the dominant structure in society would be due to what I would consider to be natural processes that would play out absent the effects of state power. And I think the key effects of state power that allow society to organize itself differently would be one, uh, the protection of private property, and two, the provision of corporate limited liability benefits. These benefits provided by the state allow systems of capitalism to arise and then to sustain themselves.
Absent these powers, I do not think that systems of capitalism uh, on a large scale would be able to sustain themselves. And uh, I will illustrate why. Many anarcho-capitalists and libertarians will argue that the rights to own and maintain private property present themselves as self-evident, and thus people will adhere to principles on a large scale that promote the protection of private property and deter acts of theft and motivation for the redistribution of property. I would argue, however, that people will not adhere to, to these principles, such as the non-aggression principle, if they start to experience certain stressors within society uh, that makes it more practical for them or seemingly more practical for them to attain wealth and sustain their lives through acts of theft, etc. And I could be wrong, and also people might argue that given this belief that people will uh, break fundamental principles uh, on a large scale, why would they adhere to principles of anarchism in the first place? And I think we have some strong indications that society would adhere to certain basic principles of anarchism while, while maybe not adhering to more specific principles such as the interpretation of destruction or theft of property representing acts of violence towards other individuals. This is because there are so many theories within anarchism that do not present this viewpoint and do not interpret the private ownership of property as something which cannot be infringed upon, and also because it is quite apparent that in the case of very wealthy property owners, uh, the property is not necessary for survival, and therefore I think that it could be very easy to bend or break these principles, which consider the destruction or theft of private property as acts of violence against these individuals. There are certain acts against property which I do think everybody agrees are acts of violence against people, like if you takes property that somebody needs to immediately survive. Uh, I think that will always be interpreted as an act of violence. I think there are much stronger arguments to establish principles that prevent the use of violence against individuals than there are to prevent the, uh, the destruction or theft of property. And even further still, as I will get to later in the video, certain acts of violence are accepted within the theories of anarchism, like say, in order to could destroy anything that could be perceived as a power structure that is representative of a state, or a power structure that has the capability to coerce large uh, portions of society. So anyway, I think the threshold for people to break principles concerning private property are considerably low, considerably lower than the thresholds to justify acts of violence against other individuals. I think it's not only people in dire straits who are in danger of starvation that will break these principles that they may have previously adhered to, uh, I would predict also that it would only take relatively minimal stress for people to change their moral systems. And I think even the perception of disempowerment could move large portions of society to reject moral, these moral principles. So for instance, things like I think if people had to work 12-hour days or had to be consistently displaced in order to maintain their survival while they had to work for others who were visibly benefiting from their sacrifices would be enough to change people's opinions. I think generationally you would see this effect happen even more. Children will rebel against the ideas of their parents, whether or not they even have very good reason to. I mean, especially children that are born into situations of poverty or situations of even discomfort, uh, of even economic discomfort in which they view other people benefiting, you know, I think that could be enough to change people's opinions on, uh, you know, what, what their principles should be within society, etc. As I said before, I think the two main effects of state power, which allow systems of capitalism and private property to sustain themselves, are the protection of private property by the state and the provision of corporate limited liability benefits. Uh, I don't think that the protection of property by individual property owners would be enough to allow systems of capitalism to sustain themselves on a large scale and over a long term. I do think that they could sustain themselves over a short term. I do think that would happen actually if society were to transition to anarchism and it might may even happen for a number of generations but I think over time essentially what will happen is that the wealth will end up being essentially redistributed throughout society as different groups within society essentially conduct acts of organized theft uh, against very wealthy property owners and, and organizations who are in control of private property on top of the expense of security which would be required to maintain these systems and I think security could get exceedingly expensive if, if society was not allowed to resort to the use of police in the defense of property uh, as I think would be the case in 
an anarchistic society is. This is one of the core principles of anarchism across all anarchist philosophies is that the use of violent coercion uh, from one individual against another is unacceptable and and justifies violent retaliation to destroy undeniable systems of violence. And again, I, I want to make the distinction that across all society, violence committed by one individual against another individual will be considered an act of violence and act of coercion, uh, whereas acts of destruction and theft of property, I think, would not be considered an act of violence across uh, much of society. So there will be more support to the, towards the abolition of police forces than there would be towards the protection of private property, essentially. And I think that, that over the generations, the expenses used to maintain private property will essentially redistribute the wealth throughout society through the form of wages and salaries paid to the workers who provide the security and investments in the technology used in these security systems. And many people might think, oh, that's you know, that sounds totally ridiculous that people would just steal property and that could actually happen and wouldn't cause a war. But society would simply not be stupid about it when they conduct acts of theft. Uh, members of society would organize very deliberately and only target property and, and infrastructure which they can definitely take without sustaining losses to life. I think there would be some losses of life. I mean, there always, I think conflict is always somewhat inherent in society at some level. But uh, this is nothing new. I mean, this is already happening in society. Uh, large states already do conduct acts of organized theft in the form of taxation. Uh, some problems do happen. Some people resist and are arrested and are violated in prison and things happen as they are being taken as they're being detained and taken to prison and society does sustain, sustain some loss some losses of human life uh, through these processes and I think there would be I think this would be no different within a system of anarchism until society became more matured in the sense that it would organize itself in a way that takes away the incentive for these acts to occur on a very large scale in a system of communes and communal living could prevent these type of activities from playing out on a large scale. Now, if processes were like these were to play out over long periods of time, I do think that there would still be systems of private property ownership, uh, although most of society would end up resorting to some structure like communal living, which shares property and thus eliminates the incentive to conduct acts of theft and redistribute wealth, and also unify society through systems of consensus and then the fact that people will live in relatively close proximity to each other while not too close proximity to each other, like in the case of ghettos and cities, such that society will essentially establish some form of economic harmonization. Although I do think that private property owners would still exist. I mean, um, I think there would be some threshold beyond which that uh, acts of theft would not, would not be advantageous to society anymore. Uh, people could accumulate uh, wealth. It just wouldn't be on the scale that it would be today. So I think it could, would be essentially somewhat of a win-win type of situation for capitalists versus communists, etc. Although the accumulation of so much wealth that might present a threat to any, uh, any particular portions of society in the form of too much advantage uh, that any small minority of people or, or any individual are, is accumulating, or the ability for uh, the ability for large companies to, to exhibit risky behavior and destroy resources which people might be relying on, etc. Uh, that would essentially be prevented. Those are the things that people would target and uh, and essentially destroy. That wealth would be redistributed to society, and and those systems of industry, etc., would be restructured. Uh, into a more collective ownership of society. And I also think over time that wealthy property owners would learn to s essentially satiate the system by proactively redistributing wealth over the time to uh, essentially meet people in the middle. So if you imagine the cost that it takes to conduct direct action operations to, to destroy or seize wealth is so much that the property owner could essentially just pay off the people that wanted to seize the wealth uh, less than they would actually lose if the people succeeded in seizing the wealth, and less than they would have to spend on extensive security systems. So other effects that I think would contribute to the downfall of uh, of capitalist of systems of capitalism and capitalist structures that would lead to the necessitation of of, uh, 
organization into like, communal structures, agrarian structures, uh, would be that systems of credit and lending would break down without fundamental property protections. Uh, the risk of lending would increase greatly. Uh, essentially, like how could you trust anybody to pay you back if you lent them money? You know, over a large scale, your risk would increase greatly. You probably would be able to still there's, there probably would be still systems of lending. However, it wouldn't be anywhere near the scale that it is today. One might say, like an advocate of anarcho-capitalism might say that, uh, oh, so if you lent somebody some kind of property and then they did not take, they did not pay you back, that could be perceived as an act of theft, which justifies acts of violence against them. So essentially, you know, you're justified in becoming a loan shark and going after people and breaking their legs if they don't, you know, pay you back or whatever. But within a system of anarchism, you know, people might perceive that as an act of violent coercion and, uh, and they would be, for the most part, justified by society on, on large scales to fight back against that kind of behavior. I mean, maybe within small segments of society that have all agreed to become anarcho-capitalist and, you know, somehow have sustained those principles culturally within their little segment of society, then that, that might be acceptable. But I think over the large scale, you're not going to get everybody to agree with that. And as I said before, if society becomes even slightly stressed out, I think that they'll break those principles. And pro private property will be the first principle to be sacrificed out of anything. And so people will fight back. If you try to, if you try to attack them because they stole your private property or whatever, they're going to fight back against you. And there will be no significant consequences for them if they do that. So, of course, if credit and lending systems break down, uh, businesses, that we, as we know, would not be possible as all business relies heavily on loans and credit to operate. Furthermore, I mentioned the effects of uh, corporate limited liability. Um, this is one thing that even if you do think and even if somehow the systems of private property were sustained and uh, society was somehow able to s sustain the system of capitalism that really you know, drives its, its power and momentum from this uh, pri you know, systems of private property and protection of private property. Corporate limited liabilities might not be a thing. Essentially, what corporate limited liabilities do is that they protect the participants in a corporation, uh, the stakeholders, etc., et from having their private property infringed upon if the corporation uh, were to fail, uh, if the corporation were to get into debt. Nobody would be justified to take the uh, personal property of the stakeholders uh, or any of the participants in the corporation from them uh, in the case that the corporation failed. Um, you know, if the corporation performed some kind of risky behavior and, and caused damages to certain individuals or certain portions of society, certain groups, those groups or those individuals would not be justified in, uh, in seizing or destroying the personal property of any of the stakeholders or participants in the corporation. And it is really state power which uh, prevents people from doing this. Um, as the st state power uh, provides protections to these people so that their their property cannot be their personal property cannot be infringed upon. So absent state power, there would not be this protection. If participants in a corporation were to cause damages to certain portions of society or accumulate debt, uh, there would be nothing stopping from the debt collectors or the individuals that were damaged to to seize the personal property or destroy the personal property of the participants in that in the corporation. So if society were to take every, so society could would, were to be justified in taking you know potentially every bit of private property uh, from those involved in these uh, in these corporate ventures, you know except except what they the bare minimum for what they need to survive because anarchist principles would dictate you know that would be an attack on a person if you if you take away the bare minimal the bare essentials that somebody needs to survive that would be equivalent I think across all of society would agree that would be equivalent to an attack, uh, an attack on somebody's person, then there would not be the incentive that corporations have now to take the kind of risk that they take that empowers corporations to grow and, and, and accumulate so much power. Even things like the accumulation of too much power, um, you know, giant corporate conglomerates, etc., just their size and their power would be perceived as being too much advantage over other people. People would say, okay, that's obviously dangerous. I'm not going to let people do that and accumulate that much power here. I'm going to destroy the structures that they've created and seize the structures that they created, take away their ability to control these structures. And there will be no government protecting them against that, that those societal forces. Again, this, this gets into like whether or not you think society is going to have this purest view of what property is and, oh, their ownership of the company is like their property and that's sacred and holy in the eyes of God or whatever. And, 
you know, everybody's just going to agree that and then not, you know, even though it's obviously against their best interest to just let these people have the property, uh, people are, are going to be so enraptured in their principles that they're going to just let these people do this completely adverse to their own best interests and not take any action against him. I mean, obviously, that just seems ridiculous that that society would allow these things to happen outside of, you know, the influence of, of violent state power that forces society to, to act certain ways. So this is this is why I think that you know systems of capitalism would not be able to sustain themselves absent state power. Thus, society would essentially be forced through what I consider to be processes of nature, which are you know human behavior being part of the processes of nature. Society would be forced on a large scale to resort to communal agrarian living in order to sustain itself. You know, absent from from the ability to to take loans, etc., society would have to structure itself such that they everybody that they interacted with they knew that they could trust, so that they do not get robbed, um, so that when they do make loans to people, they know they know that they're they're going to get paid back uh, at least to some extent, and to gain the economies of scale which communal living uh, provides uh, in order for society to be able to. Uh, you know, conduct agriculture sustainably and have surplus energy left to establish industry and and conduct industrial pursuits such as like mining and development of technology, et cetera, et cetera. I think further forces which would uh, push society to adopt this mode of living would be the um, would be security threats for people in urban settings. Essentially, uh, the absence of police, uh, absence of things like uh, gun control. Uh, potential absence of uh, taxation, uh, you know, systems of redistribution of wealth to pay for physical security for those at the lower levels of society who are uh, who are stuck in cities or who want to somehow live in cities in urban environments it might not be there. I mean, they would have to essentially have some access to physical wealth, which would allow them to sustain themselves over the long term, such as land. Land is probably the the, the best source of sustainable wealth that that human beings have. And land is not something, you know, at least arable land, is not something that people have within cities. Uh, nor do they have natural resources like minerals from the ground, et cetera, et cetera, inside of cities. So I think that, you know, in the absence of the state, cities w would not be able to sustain themselves. I think ultimately that's a good thing. The people who really want to live in cities would make it happen, more or less. I mean, you know, it wouldn't be anything like it is now, but you wouldn't have the negative effects of cities, which I think far, far outweigh the inconvenience that people would experience by not being able to live their dream situation of being in a city and, you know, being surrounded by tons of people that they could interact with and do whatever it is that they want. I think some of the aspects of the communal, some of the aspects of the communal arrangement, again, which make it a sustainable mode of, of economy, a sustainable mode of living for the majority of society, would be that it gets around the extensive need for physical security and, and violent policing because communes would essentially be small enough or at least communes that are sustainable and successful would be small enough such that everybody would know each other more or less within the communes. All activities within the communes could be easily monitored. Uh, without the use of very sophisticated technology. Geographical separation between each commune would make it extremely difficult for uh, those who might consider miscreants or uh, people who are afflicted by psychopathy, you know, psychopaths, to move between communities and establish anonymity that allows them to conduct acts of violence. If they do interact with other communities, you can easily rule out where they would have come from because of the geographical separation. You know, they essentially they wouldn't be able to get that far without you knowing like exactly like there's a specific radius that they must have came from. Sharing of resources within each commune would take away incentive for theft within the commune which could be destructive behavior. Equality within each commune would take away uh, incentive for destructive behavior for, uh, for a large part. Participation in a regular consensus which would bring people together closer culturally and ensure society within the communes are responding to the changing needs of the generations and the changing need of the environment. Many, as I was alluding to, would reject communal lifestyle. And we've seen this in history that people do reject communal lifestyle. People who have uh, grown up in communes do reject and sometimes quite strongly reject communal lifestyle. But anarchist principles would ensure freedom of movement. Uh, essentially, you cannot coerce people into staying, remaining in a commune. That would go against anarchist principles, and each commune would 
probably be slightly different from each other, have slightly different rules, cities and industrial centers would also probably exist, like I said, on, on a much smaller scale so that people do have options in social mobility if they're that disaffected with communal lifestyle. Uh, that, that's one of the beauties of anarchism is that you're not being forced by necessarily any people to do things. Really what's forcing you is like the forces of nature to, if, you, if you're being forced to do anything. So that, and, and that's another misperception that people maybe have. Like anarchism is about like absolute liberty and freedom. It's like no, not really. Anarchism is about sustainable life in the absence of state violence. So anyway, there are many different facets to the structure and dynamics of uh, communes and communal living, and there are problem problems with communal systems, and uh, this will be discussed in further videos. Like, like for instance, if within certain communes people enforce very strict rules, like religious rules, etc., if they do try to prevent people from leaving the communes, and uh, somehow the rest of society doesn't know about that, I'll get more into detail about that, but essentially what I think society would resort to to keep a system of communes bound together, also with systems of capitalism and small segments of society that live in urban lifestyles, small industrial centers, etc. What I do think would happen is that federations would form, rather confederations would form, in which groups proactively confederate themselves to ensure broad rules, such as like, you know, you can't coerce somebody into remaining within a particular commune. That's how the principles of anarchism would essentially bind society together and present mobility for those who are disaffected within any, their particular situation in any segments of society. So I'll also get more into this in another video, but, but one might predict that probably one of the best ways to transition into anarchism or set up an anarchistic society would be to essentially start out structured this way, where you're structured in a system of uh, communes in order to avoid the effects of transition while society is struggling to survive, is struggling to kind of figure out how to make this whole thing work, you know, this, this new system of, of uh, self-governance work, and prevent the changes in political momentum from obstructing the achievement of, like, the bigger picture, which is to sustain a society that is absent of government. So that wraps it up for this video. I will create more videos to go deeper into some of the topics that were brought up in this video. Uh, trust me, there are many more to come. Definitely make sure to leave comments below. I know this is a controversial topic, especially this one I think is controversial among different anarchists. Please leave the comments below. I will definitely respond to them. And I'll make further videos on, on comments which I think really need to be discussed further. So please make sure to check out my Patreon page if you can. Make a donation if you want me to keep making these videos and uh, sustain this channel. You can donate Bitcoin, Monero. I have a pay link to PayPal below. Make sure you hit the like button on this if you want to become more visible to people and uh, subscribe to the channel, etc. So anyways, thanks again for watching my video and uh, let's keep the conversation going. Peace.